The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. The Radio Memories Network welcomes you to the world of modern radio theater, an old medium revived for a new era through the Radio Memories Network. From the four corners of this world, there are more than 341 million people who speak English. This is the Society of the Ear, the Society of the Mind. Our voices are legion. Here we have the opportunity to spread stories through the theater of the mind all across the cyber byways and radial beacons. We are inclusive. We are eclectic. We are collective. We are the Sonic Society. Welcome to another meeting of the Sonic Society. I'm your host, Jack Ward. Each week we delve into the suspenseful and the sublime, the action-packed and the erudite. We look into masterpieces of audio cinema and some of the mayhem behind the sonic scenery. Membership is inclusive. You already have the best seat in the house. Orson Welles knew how to draw a crowd. Whether it was from his groundbreaking Macbeth with all-black cast or frightening Middle America with the invasion of Martians in his recreation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds... Orson understood that radio drama, that audio cinema, required one fundamental rule, make use of excellent material. This lesson wasn't lost in Sound Mind Theater's production of The Curse of Dracula. Drawing upon the classic Bram Stoker tale, Lee Davis produces a modern audio horror sure to raise shivers. Later, we'll have a conversation with Mr. Davis from Sound Mind Theater and continue our weekly serial from Dream Realm Enterprises with Robots of the Company, Episode 6. But without further ado, let us wing our way through suspense with The Curse of Dracula, here on the Sonic Society. Now, Sound Mind Theater presents a new radio drama inspired by characters created by legendary author macabre Bram Stoker. Listen. Listen to our tale of mystery, danger, and the supernatural. Listen as the dungeon door opens on our story of... of Dracula. Dear Arthur, as you know, I haven't been in touch for about a week. I know, I know, you always told me that a good reporter keeps her editor informed, but you also told me never to submit anything unless it was the complete story. Well... These are the events that brought me to this moment in time, sitting here alone, typing on my laptop, waiting for Count Dracula. Okay, this story begins one week ago. You were in your office at the paper in Atlanta, and I was 20,000 feet straight above you. You're calling from where? A jet. We just took off from Hartsfield. Hartsfield? As in Hartsfield International Airport? Yes, I'm on a sky phone. I, look, I called to tell You're you... You're supposed to be in Savannah, Mina, covering the flower show, like I told you. I've got something better for you, Arthur. I don't want something better. You're a newspaper reporter. I'm a newspaper editor. I assign you to cover things, you cover them. That's how this little game works. This is the very reason I sent you to work out of Savannah for a while. Remember, Mina? 
You're a good reporter, Mina Murray. I've never seen a greedy with so much natural talent. But you're so full of yourself and, and you're stubborn as a mule. You need to be taken down a notch or two. I love you like an uncle. Now, you know that. And when you love somebody, sometimes you... Well, you have to... You have to banish them. Savannah's a good news town. Besides, your boyfriend Jonathan, Mr. Real Estate, lives down there. And your friend Lucy is letting you stay at her little motel for free. Never mind, never mind. Look, I called to tell you my Stoker interview should be ready for next week's living section. Stoker interview? Jonathan's real estate firm assigned him to go to Transylvania and get Brom Stoker's signature on a contract. So I'm going along to interview Stoker one-on-one right after the wedding. Oh, 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 hold the phone. Start back at the beginning. Uh, Okay. Remember on the phone the other day, I said that I saw in Entertainment Monthly how one of the Hollywood studios paid $5 million for the movie rights to a new book by Bram Stoker, the great-great-great-grandson of the guy who wrote Dracula. And you said Stoker's new novel, The Curse of Dracula, was sure to be next summer's big movie blockbuster and that you'd give anything to give an exclusive interview with a guy. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well... Jonathan's going to Transylvania to get Brom Stoker's signature on a contract, so I'm going along. I'll email the interview back to you, okay? So have a great week. Oh, yeah, I knew you'd be as excited as I am about the Stoker interview, so uh, I, I forged your name on an expense account voucher. Listen to me and listen good. I want you to turn around. The plane. I want you to turn it around. Now you go up to the cockpit and you tell the pilot to turn back to Atlanta and tell him not to be surprised to see a fat, balding white guy running toward the plane like a bat out of Helena when it lands. Because I'm Whew. personally in heart's I'd forgotten how cramped those airline toilets were. Everything all right, dear? Uh, yes. Who's on the phone? Arthur. Um, um, I'll give Jonathan your regards. Right. Bye bye. <laughs> Is he excited about the trip? Uh, delirious. What about you? Uh, stomach still nervous? Yeah, I'm okay. I just can't help thinking about poor Renfield, that's all. He was salesman of the year last year, you know. It, they send him to get this same contract signed in Transylvania, and when he gets back... He was a walking time bomb, Jonathan. Everybody said so. Yeah, but now he sits alone all day in that psych ward, counting his buttons and eating flies. Yeah, look, the difference between you and Renfield is that he didn't go crazy until after he got to Transylvania. <laughs> you lost it weeks ago and you proposed to me. <laughs> mm. Wait until we've been married a few years. You'll know what crazy is. I was friends with the guy, that's all. <laughs> I know, I know. With some rest, he'll be fine. You called your editor. Why don't you just take a moment and phone your dad? Phone my dad? For what? To let him know his only daughter is going to be married in romantic old Vienna? You should phone him, Mina. You know I don't want anything else to do with my dad and his pious little world. Mina, it's silly to blame your dad and his faith for your mother's death. Drop it, Jonathan. It's been six months. I said drop it! I just think he'd like to hear from you, that's all. I got a couple of faxes this morning. One from the Hotel Vienna... We got the bridal suite. Wonderful! And Bram Stoker's book publisher says they're not allowing any official interviews. No interviews? No official interviews. But they said I could ask for an unofficial interview. Oh, Jonathan, I love you! (laughs) So, 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 you'll meet with him first, okay? And then talk him into seeing me? Yes, I will. Ah! Promise? Cross my heart, hope to die. Neither Jonathan nor I were what you'd call frequent international flyers, so it came as quite a shock to learn as we stepped off the jet, expecting to get married at the Hotel Vienna, that Austrian time was about seven hours ahead of Eastern Daylight Time. And that meant Jonathan had only three hours to get to Bram Stoker's great-great-great-grandson's house, which was three hours away by train. We had to go straight to the station. I kissed Jonathan goodbye. And as I did, I got an eerie sensation that I would never see him again. When I checked into the Hotel Vienna bridal suite, alone, the innkeeper's wife was sympathetic. Oh, one person spending the night alone by herself, with her young hair not alone with her? This is not a pretty picnic. (laughs) No, Miss Hamill, it's not a pretty picnic. (laughs) You, You will join him later? 
Yes, uh, tomorrow, hopefully. If he can get permission for me to interview Bram Stoker. Stoker? You've heard of him, I'm sure. Descendant of the man who wrote... Oh, please, Dra please, please, please. Do not speak with your mouth that name. You mean Dra... Please! You will curse my inn and all that abide here. You will wait here. Uh, you will wait here. Uh, you will you will take this with you, uh, for to keep on your person. A rosary? I'm not Catholic. Neither is he. Well, under your clothes, and, and this, well, outside your clothes. A necklace? A crucifix. Wear it, and here is some garlic. Put cloves of garlic under your pillow when you are sleeping in the bed at night. But Mrs. Hamill, I... <coughs> Mrs. Hamill, I don't take them for your mother's sake. Three hours to Transylvania, 30 minutes to get to the castle, then maybe two hours worth of real estate chit-chat with the devil over dinner. I expected Jonathan back in Vienna on the late train. I waited at the station until 3 a.m. The coach, when it did finally arrive, was empty. Had I known what my dear, sweet Jonathan was going through, I... Only much later did I learn the details through the memos he recorded on his pocket tape recorder. Memo to Bonnie at the travel agency. Dear Bonnie, obviously Mr. Stoker is trying to show me some local color with this horse-drawn mix master. But the antique delight of it all wore off the tenth time I had hit the... Ow, roof. I feel like I'm trapped in a paint shaker. <sighs> if we can just get the door open... That... It was quite a ride. You wish me to stay until your business is concluded? Yes, I do. I did not think so. Memo to self. Pack a flashlight. You know, you know I, I think I'm here on the wrong night. <clears throat> Memo to Bonnie at the travel agency. I'm going to get you for this. Mr. Harker. Yes, I'm Jonathan Harker. So nice to finally meet you, sir. You are alone. Alone? Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid I had the wrong night, or the wrong hour. You know, daylight savings time kicks in about this time of year back home, and, um... Listen to them. The children of the night. What music they make. Please, come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I bid you welcome. I am Dracula. <laughs> say, that's... No, that's pretty good. <laughs> I guess your visitors expect to hear you say that, right? I mean, so... So I disappoint them. <laughs> you said, I am Dracula. I mean, you're, 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 you're trying to scare me, right? My servants are away tonight, sir. May I take your coat? No, no thanks. Uh, all I have is this jacket. And I have to admit, I was ill-prepared for the change in uh, temperature. You have traveled a great distance. Oh, yeah, well, it's no problem. Um, <laughs> lots of my clients like to conduct business in person, you know, and mm. instead of through the mail or by fax. And, well, plus Carfax, the estate you're buying, it's not exactly a shack in the woods. So I'm sure you know that it was the Confederate equivalent of Fort Knox during the Civil War. A gold repository. In, in fact, in the same neighborhood, there's another historic structure that I'm really familiar with. It's a it's a bed and breakfast. Follow me. Fist owned by. Of course. <sighs> this is more like it. It's so light and cheery in here, and, and the table set for dinner. And oh, fire. Now that's a welcome sight. Oh, please, warm yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh boy, this, this is great. I assume the uh, contracts are in your briefcase. Yes, yes they are. Um, would you like to just go ahead and, and sign them now? Enter. Ah, oh, good evening, my lovelies. <laughs> Gretchen, Olivia... Anna, 
Meet Mr. Harker. Welcome, Mr. Harker. Yes, welcome. We hope we have prepared your quarters to your liking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies. But I can't stay. We can't close on the house until I get this contract back to Savannah. <laughs> Are you three in some sort of singing group? <laughs> singing group? The long white gowns, the heavy pale makeup. Um... <laughs> Yes. Well, like I said, uh, I'd like to stay, but now if you'd be so kind as to escort me to the door. Now, husband. Now. He is with you. Good night, Mr. Harker. Uh, uh, sweet dreams. <laughs> no. Uh, wait. 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 Mr. Stoker. Mr. Stoker. Come back. Ladies, I, I, I told you I, I can't stay. I... Excuse me, ladies. Let me by, please. What are you doing? No! No! Get away! For 48 hours, I practically slept at the Vienna train depot. Mr. and Mrs. Himmel tried to comfort me with tales of how poor communications were in this region of Europe, but it was obvious they held little hope for Jonathan's safe return. Noon of the third day, I received a telegram from the Holy Cross leper colony in the small town of Bistriz, nearly five miles from Castle Dracula. Jonathan was alive. He had had a mild concussion, a fractured rib, and some of the worst bruises the doctors had ever seen down his back and across his midsection. But he was alive, and he would recover with proper rest and a nurse's care. Sure, why not? This is the slow season, and somebody may as well take advantage of the nursing degree my daddy paid for. Jonathan did not hold much affection for my friend, Lucy Westenra. Dingy, he called her, since the day that she graduated from nursing school and announced that she was moving to Savannah, Georgia, to run a tiny motel she'd bought out of an ad in the back of the Southern Living magazine. Growing up with Lucy was fun. She was sweet, mischievous, totally unpredictable. And yes, dingy, which in Jonathan's eyes meant irresponsible. But when I phoned her, and with no hint from me, she volunteered to shut down the bed and breakfast for a month and allow Jonathan to recuperate in Savannah. I knew this was an opportunity to get my fiancé back up on his feet and show him what a loving, wonderful friend-in-law he was getting. By the way, what does your daddy say about all this Dracula stuff? He, uh, he, he doesn't have an opinion. Because you haven't told him, have you? My stars, man, he's your daddy! I'll call him and tell him Jonathan and you are coming here and that you're okay. Whatever. I think, I think I've got all the details. Day after tomorrow, you'll fly into Atlanta, then catch a commuter plane to Savannah. I'll send Quincy to pick you up at 5 o'clock. Quincy? Oh, I forgot to tell you. A guy I went to nursing school with showed up here right after you left. Quincy Morris. Do you remember him? Uh, vaguely, Quincy Morris... Uh... Beatnik type, right? What, uh, uh, he, was, he was a movie nut. Still is. He says he's been looking all over the southeast for me for months. He says he's ready to settle down, and I'm the one he wants to settle down with. What? Yeah, he says I'm his soulmate. But you're not interested in him? No. Tell him to take a hike. I would, but I need the septic tank pumped out. I'm going to let him stay in the guest quarters out back until he realizes I'm not his soulmate or until my fall repair jobs are all done, whichever comes first. Oh, did I tell you I'm thinking about joining the Peace Corps? Do they still have the Peace Corps? Gee, I don't know. <laughs> they still have monks, don't they? Well, I'm thinking about becoming a monk, too. Lucy, monks are guys. I must be playing their records at the wrong speed. Quincy picked us up at the Savannah Airport. You too comfortable back there? Hey, if you're in the newspaper business, you must know some people in the other media, right? Like movie producers? Know any movie producers? Um, none to speak of. Well, I got my degree in biomedical engineering, but I'm really a screenwriter, you know? Right now I'm working on a horror movie. It's called That Thing Over There. It's going to be a whole series of pictures. First, that thing over there. Then, 
the return of that thing over there. And then that thing still over there. Then I need a flashlight or I might get eaten by that thing over there. And finally, hey, you kids, get away from that thing over there. What do you think? Mina, make him stop. Uh, tell you what, uh, Quincy, Jonathan's supposed to conserve his drink, so mm. why don't we hold down the talking right. and just let him take a nap? Good. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, a good title makes a horror movie. Oh. Don't you think? Like, for instance, Attack of the Beanbag Chairs. Good title, good movie. And the Crazy Maniac Guy series. Crazy Maniac Guy with an axe. Crazy Maniac Guy with a soldering iron. Crazy Maniac Guy with a hairdryer. Colon, never bathe again. Good titles, good movies. And the Quincy with his shaggy hair, goatee and earring, reminded me of the laid-back dreamers that the teen philosophers and the future felons Lucy used to date in high school. Why she refused to get close to this particular member of that species, I wasn't sure. Maybe Quincy was just trying too hard for his own good. Anyway, soon we arrived at Lucy's bed and breakfast, a one-story 19th century farmhouse surrounded by mossy oaks. But it turns back into an insurance salesman, so they shoot it again just to be sure. The end. Fade out, roll titles. Hey, we're here. Quincy, um... Who's that older guy walking toward us and those two men dressed in white with Lucy? That's Dr. Van Helsing. He's the head man at the new insane asylum. Insane asylum? Down the road, yeah. Oh, and I almost forgot to tell you. Watch out for Lucy's weird mood. What kind of weird mood? She's been in it since late last night. Um, do me a favor, will you, Mina? What kind of favor? Put in a few good words for me, with Lucy. You know when you can. I really care about her. A lot. Okay? Okay. Welcome home, Mina. Welcome home, Mina? What kind of greeting is that? Lucy, give us a hug. There's time enough for that later. You had a safe journey? Yeah, uh, we did. Uh, Jonathan's asleep. Dr. Van Helsing, this is Mina. Ah, Miss Westenra has told me a lot about you, Miss Murray. Charmed. Uh, hello. With a sharp wave of his hand, Dr. Van Helsing, a bald 60-ish man wearing thick, thick glasses and a gray business suit, signaled the two men in white. One of them opened Jonathan's car door. The other scooped him out and effortlessly carried him into the house. Half an hour later, with the sun a bright October orange on the horizon and Jonathan resting peacefully in his room, Lucy, Quincy, and I saw the doctor out. Will you and your assistants stay and dine with us, Dr. Van Helsing? Thank you for the kind offer, Miss Westera. But I have already dismissed my men back to the hospital, and I thought I might drop in on the Macmillans in the next house down. Did Mrs. Macmillan have her baby yet? Mother and child are at home and resting well. At home and resting well. That would be a good movie title. Quincy said you work near here, Doctor? This past Wednesday, we occupied the building that formerly housed the Savannah Emergency Clinic. We? We're a mental health facility. I believe you know one of our patients, a Mr. Renfield? Renfield? He's spoken of you and your fiancé, and... He claims to know our new neighbor at Carfax. New neighbor? You mean someone bought Carfax, the old Confederate building? This week, things have changed a lot. Good title. The week things changed a lot. I saw the movers at Carfax early yesterday morning and tried to call on Mr. Stoker. Stoker? Did you see Stoker? Meet meet him? No, I... I only know the name because it was written on the mover's recorder. Uh, Mr. Bram Stoker. From? From Eastern Europe. New neighbors? Hey, this place could use some fresh blood. Fresh blood. Good title. That's the bell beside Jonathan's bed. I shall see to his needs. Help me open the window in his room, will you, Quincy? Let in some of this fresh night air. 
Listen. Wolves. That's not wolves. What's wrong with you, Lucy? That's that old hound dog at the Macmillan place howling for a supper. Shut up, Blue. Still, listen to them. The children of the night. What music they make. Good evening, Doctor. Quincy? Coming. The children of the night. I like that. Have a pleasant evening. Miss Murray, forgive my seeming forward, but I am concerned about your friend. Well, if you don't mind my asking, exactly what kind of doctor are you? I am a psychiatric physician with a doctorate in hallucinatory medicine. I was educated in Berlin, but I was born in Transylvania. Transylvania? Yeah. There I learned the truth. So, what is the truth, Dr. Van Helsing? The truth is that the Bram Stoker novel was less fiction than autobiography. And the truth is that a large black box was delivered to the Carfax estate yesterday morning. A coffin. Lined, I suspect, with an inch-thick bed of Carpathian soil. I tried to force it open, but I hadn't the strength. I work with lunatics, Miss Mary. Men and women who seem attuned to voices beyond the realm of the natural. Like... Renfield? Yeah, and for some time now, those voices have been warning that he was coming. He? Count Dracula. B -b but why is he coming? W why is he here? I do not know, but I believe he is responsible for Miss Westerner's state of mind. You're saying Lucy's been turned into a vampire? Th that's ridiculous. Okay, she may sound weird, but she's up and walking. She's in the daylight, even. It takes more than one encounter for someone to fall full victim to the curse of Dracula. He will undoubtedly approach her again tonight. That is why the timing of our plan must be perfect. Uh, our plan? I assume you wish to protect your friend from harm. After nightfall, once Dracula has risen from his coffin, I shall steal it away and destroy it. Come sunrise, he will have no shelter from the sun. Wait, sunlight is supposed to turn a vampire into dust, right? That is correct. You're going to steal the coffin, but you just said it was too heavy. For me, but not for Eric and Carl. Eric and... Oh, okay, your men in white. <laughs> yeah, they look strong enough to move the world. Okay, when do we leave? It's best you stay here. No, I'm going. Someone must protect this house. What with your fiancé being incapacitated, Miss Westerner being under a spell, and Quincy being... Well, Quincy. Uh, are you a religious woman, Miss Murray? Ah, uh, I used to be. Hmm, pity. You must double your protection, then. After I am gone, close and lock all the windows and doors. There is a spice rack in the pantry. Grind and sprinkle the more pungent spices, especially the garlic, on the floor around each bed. Search the house for crucifixes, Bibles, and the like, and display them prominently. I wasn't sure I bought this whole Dracula thing. But to play it safe, I decided to follow Dr. Van Helsing's directions to the letter, beginning in Lucy's bedroom. I prefer the French doors stay open. I... Um, the weatherman says it's supposed to rain. I'd hate for moisture to ruin all those beautiful antiques, especially that old stand-up Victrola. Where did you get that? What did you say? Where did you get that old, um, um, yes, record Yes, I do. Player? You know I do. Lucy? But why her? Won't I do? You know I would make a good wife. Yes. I will. All right, master. Mina? Huh? He wants to speak with you. Who does? He will meet you outside in front of the house. What's he want to speak to me about? Go to him. Now. You have been chosen to become his bride. Through the front window, I could make him out. A tall, motionless figure standing in the shadows of the lawn. Pale, white face. Eyes and teeth gleaming. His shiny, knee-length cape 
wrapped tightly around him like some evil cocoon. He wants to talk to me about unholy matrimony, eh? I said to myself. Fine, we'll talk. And the longer we talk, the more time it will give Van Helsing and his muscle men. Quincy! You know, I was thinking, there's a pit out back where they used to hold baptisms. Jonathan's got some bad bruises on his rear and legs. We might be able to use that cement pond for muscle therapy, like they do at some hospitals. Oh, we'll talk about that later. Um, Right now, uh, one of Dr. Van Helsing's patients has escaped, and he's out in the front yard. Want me to shoo him away? From what the doc says, they're pretty harmless. No, I'll shoo him away. You just get a baseball bat or a polo mallet or a snow shovel, whatever you can find, and, and be my bodyguard. Well, okay. Is it Renfield? I don't know. It's probably Renfield. According to the doc, he's always trying to escape, and he's afraid of water. I'll get a bucket. No, get a weapon, and, and meet me on the porch in five minutes. Hello. Good evening. Can't you step into the light? I, I can't see you. Better yet, uh, come inside. No. I dare not enter this house. Allow me to formally introduce myself. I am Count Dracula. I am Mina Murray. And I am Quincy P. Morris. Okay, Renfield, I know it's you. You're trying to scare us dressed as Batman. Well, it won't work, so why don't you just skedaddle back up to the nut house? Go on. Quincy. I got a bucket of water here, and I'm going to throw no. it on you if you're not gone by the time I count to three. Quincy, this is Dracula. Whatever. One. The real Dracula. Right. And I'm Dorothy, and I'm going to drench the Wicked Witch of the West if she don't fly away. You Two. You should listen to your beautiful friend, Mr. Morris. I am Count Dracula. Yeah? Then turn into a vampire bat. Quincy! Go ahead, Lugosi. Change into a bat and bite me. Watch out! Hey! I want to know something if you're through. Yes. Why Jonathan? Why Lucy? And why me? My plan was to purchase the Carfax estate and draw your Mr. Harker to Transylvania in hopes that you would accompany him. And when that did not work... I had no alternative but to journey here and claim you. Claim me? You, Mina Murray, are the mirror image of Helena Kraus. Who's Helena Kraus? The only true talent to ever grace the European stage. A goddess. Her fair skin, her bright eyes, her flowing mane of red hair. I get it. You were in love with some actress, but she broke your heart. I look like her, so you want me to join your harem? Well, your appearance is not the full reason you have been chosen. What's the rest of it? Your heart is cold. What? You were raised the daughter of a minister, born into a home that respected good, treasured all that was holy. But when your mother became ill, your heart changed. What? You don't know anything about me. Oh, I know your father and his church prayed your mother would survive, and you took their personal words of encouragement as promises that she would survive, only she did not. And you cursed them for lying to you. You cursed God for being so unfeeling as to take away your loving mother. Your heart grew cold and hard and dark. You no longer have... Any use for this world, Mina. Now, your soul seeks comfort in the dark. I can take you there, Mina. I can take you into the darkness. Close your eyes. Yes. I see it. It's a palace. A palace of orange and red. Walls of stone that climb up to eternity. Fire, oh, pools of fire all over. Yes. I, I hear people crying. Men 
women and children crying in torment. Who are they? They are your subjects, Queen Mina. They cry for your attention. For my attention? Oh, I should go to them. Then, shouldn't I? Yes. Yes, you will go to them. We will go together. Rule them together. You and I, come with me. Come with me, Mina. Come and be my bride. What are you doing? Your neck, so warm, so full of life. Stop! Miss Murray! You recognize this, don't you, Count Regular? The holy symbol, the crucifix. What is it? What's going on? Dr. Van Helsing, did you destroy the coffin? <laughs> you, you'll have to find my coffin before you can destroy it, Van Helsing. And I've hidden it in a safe place. <laughs> Is he gone? Yeah. Did he harm you, Miss Murray? No, thanks to you. I'll have to find tonight's ration of blood somewhere else. Lucy! You're listening to the Sonic Society, and I'm Jack Ward. The Curse of Dracula Part 2 begins in a moment. Hello? Anybody there? You know we are. Who are you? We've always been there. Listening. Who are you? What do you want? You've heard of the society. The society? The Sonic Society. I know you know. No. No. This is crazy. I I'm gonna hang up. We'll be here, Andrew. We never really left. No one makes radio plays anymore. We do. Our numbers are legion. We're growing every day. And we're waiting for you. For me? We're waiting for you to join us, Andrew. Join you? But... but why? Because radio drama lives. <laughs> We now return to the Sonic Society with The Curse of Dracula. Quincy, where's Lucy? I've been looking for her. She's gone. Lucy! You check on Jonathan for me. Right. Be right back. Doctor, he's outfoxing us both so far. What's our next move? I regret to say that our next move must be the realization that Miss Westerner has crossed over. She belongs to Dracula. No! Which means she, too, will be subject to the deadly rays of the sun come morning. She must find her own hiding place, her own coffin. Lucy. At the risk of sounding callous, we haven't time to grieve. Our common danger has doubled with two vampires at large. Now, where would Count Dracula find a coffin for his new convert? In the cemetery. Jonathan! Oh. Oh, darling, you ought to stay in bed. It's save your strength. Through my window, I saw Stoker standing outside, calling to Lucy. She came to him, and they both walked east. You mean towards town? Yes. Toward the Confederate Cemetery. Ah, the Confederate Cemetery, yeah. Just a minute. Jonathan, you say the vampire called for Lucy to come to him. Yes, from the garden. A and on the porch, when I asked him to come inside, the very idea seemed to agitate him. Uh, doctor, could, could there be something in this house that... That frightens the so-called Prince of Darkness? Mm, something in the house, or perhaps even the house itself. I do not pretend to understand the mind of the vampire, but I suspect we all know one who may. Renfield. Renfield. How do you know Renfield? 
There is something about this house that makes it off limits to Count Dracula. We should know about it. It may help us beat him. Jonathan, I'll fill you in on everything in the way. Doctor, you phone the asylum. They will offer you every courtesy. And will you and I do, Doc? We, my good Quincy, are off to the Confederate cemetery. Quincy glanced at his wristwatch as he and Dr. Van Helsing reached the Confederate cemetery. The night was unusually bright with gleams of moonlight between the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. There, that tomb. The doctor pointed toward a squatty gray stone structure, half covered over with vines. He unlocked the door and entered first himself. The tomb seemed twice as large inside, cold. Canvas bag I asked you to bring along. There's a lantern inside. Van Helsing lit the lantern and held it high. Alone in the middle of the room was a coffin. Quincy fished a short crowbar out of the bag and pried the lid off. Empty. It awaits the new vampire. Mr. Quincy, if you will step to the rear and push, I believe I can guide the front of the coffin toward the door. What are we going to do? Burn it. If I tell you why he won't enter your house, w will you give me a puppy? Renfield, you want... He wants a, a puppy. Oh, yeah. I used to simply eat flies, you know. Then I realized that the life force I sought from eating flies could be multiplied if I ate what ate the flies. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, I guess. Oh, certainly it does. So I changed my diet to spiders. Uh, then a sparrow flew in my room one day and ate one of my spiders. So you ate a, the bird? Oh, well, yeah. For the life force. Exactly. But, but, but puppies don't eat birds. I know that. But they won't give me a cat. We'll speak to the doctor about it, Renfield. So tell us what's so special about that house. Well, it was a church. What? That's right. The first African church of Savannah met there before Lucy bought it. My master cannot enter. Yes. What did you say? Yes, master, I'm listening. Renfield? Yes. Who's he talking to? Lucy heard voices the same way. Yes. Oh, very well. Uh, I will tell them, master. Ah. Uh, uh, my master says you're doomed. <laughs> you and your friends at the Confederate cemetery. <laughs> Is Dracula at the cemetery now? He's with his new convert, helping her find sustenance. <laughs> sustenance? Dinner. Dracula may be having the doctor and Quincy for dinner right now. Let's go, Mina. Goodbye for now, Renfield. A goodbye for now. A dinner party, you say? Well, sounds like fun. If I'm not there on time, you go ahead and begin without me. And remember the puppy. The ancient wooden coffin caught fire like lighter. The flames cast tall shadows against the surrounding pines. And for nearly an hour, Quincy stood, warming himself, thinking sweet, melancholy thoughts of the first and only date he'd had with Lucy some years back. He still recalled what she ate at the restaurant, the movie they saw. He remembered her perfume and how she refused him a goodnight kiss by saying she had a slight cold. I can see something white coming through the trees. Lucy! No, 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 no. You, you scare her away. But she looks fine. She looks happy. Of course she looks happy. She's got a baby. Oh, as I feared, the Macmillan child... Miss Lucy has taken her first victim, the Macmillan child. Let her approach, let her approach. There's a wooden stake in the bag and a hammer. Get them. Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Well, this is an odd place for a cookout. Well, that's quite a fire. <gasps> what are you burning? Please, Lucy, snap out of this trance or whatever it is. You can do it if you really try. Tell me, what are you burning? Your coffin. We're burning your coffin. No! Lucy ran to the edge of the bonfire, and in the naked light, her face drew into an angry snarl. Then she spun around and threw the baby at Van Helsing. 
The doctor caught the baby and held it close, checking to see that it was still breathing. Alternating arms, he yanked off his coat and made a haphazard bed for the child on the ground. Mr. Quincy, the stake! The vampire snarled at the deadly tools in Quincy's hands. Then she looked at him square in the face and smiled. She stretched her arms towards him as if inviting a kiss. Come to me, Quincy. Leave these others and come to me. Mr. Quincy! My arms are hungry for you. Come and we can rest together. Lucy. Quincy opened his arms wide. We belong together. I've waited so long to hear those words. Suddenly, Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his silver crucifix. She recoiled from it and fell. The doctor held the cross square above her, the force of the holy symbol pinning her to the ground. Put the stake to her breast, now! I can't! You must! Only her true love has the right to strike the blow that sets her free! Only her true love. You say you returned the baby to her parents. And they had no idea she was gone. Good. The undead have the ability to pass through walls. Pass through walls. Anyway, I called you back. He called you back because Jonathan, the fearless vampire killer, thinks he knows how to capture Dracula. Well, I do. Well, then explain it to me. Well, first, we must know where his coffin is hidden. He told us that it was in a safe place. Safe place. Safe place. Take a look at these architect's drawings of Carfax. Look here. Under these stairs, as a safeguard against the Yankees stealing all their gold, the Confederates installed a large hidden safe, a walk-in vault, here, under this staircase. Dracula's coffin is in that safe? I bet the farm on it. So we go to Carfax and wait for him. No, no, let's think this through. Um, what happens if you do try to ambush Dracula? If he can pass through walls like you said... He could slip by us, into the sealed-up vault. And we couldn't touch him. But he has to come out sometime. Not necessarily. Time is nothing to Count Dracula. He needs blood to survive, but the blood of Miss Westerner and any other victim this night could sustain him for days. No, Mr. Harker is correct. Confronting this vampire at his tomb is unwise. So, Mr. Harker, what's your idea? Well, Carfax is about 200 yards from here. I did some research on Mina's laptop, and bats can fly, but they can't fly very fast. I think if we can detain Dracula here until just before sunup, well, tonight is the last Sunday in October. So it's the last Sunday in October. So what? Your American custom of daylight savings time. Yes. That ends tonight? Daylight savings time? Do we move our clocks forward an hour or back an hour? I can never keep up. It's spring ahead, fall back. We move the clocks back. A native of the old country would know nothing of this American custom. I believe I understand your plan, Mr. Hart. Well, I don't. Then you won't go along with what I have in mind? No, I'll go along. If you really think you can trap Count Dracula. I do. And you, me and my love, are going to be the bait. <gasps> Dear Arthur... As you know, I haven't emailed or called you for about a week. I know, I know you always told me that a good reporter keeps her editor informed, but he also told me never to submit anything to you if it wasn't the complete story. Well, these are the events that brought me to this moment in time. Sitting here alone typing on my laptop, waiting for Count Dracula. Yes? Who's out there? Who's out there, I said. Nina. Jonathan! Well, you, Mr. Harker, is not here. Jonathan! Stay away from me. Dr. Van Helsing! I'm in the garden. Open the doors and come to me, my Mina. Quincy! Open the doors. I command you. 
What have you done with Jonathan and the others? We are alone. The others are at Carfax. No, they're not. They're here. They, they, they wouldn't leave me here all alone. Dr. Van Helsing! They wait to trap me as I return to rest, but in their childish haste, they serve as assistants to our wedding. They serve as assistants? No, oh, they are, in fact, giving away the bride. What, what is that machine in the uh, corner there? A Victrola? Yes. Music. Oh, what is a wedding without music? Make it play. I command you. Dance with me in the garden. No. Dance with me. My Helena. The sun will rise. Oh, no. Not for another hour. An hour? Oh, the sun rises today at 6.10. And presently, it is 5 a.m. Now dance. I am pleased that you want to know about the ways of the undead. I, I, I do. Are, are you a clock watcher? Uh, I do consult the clock during these small hours. Uh, from here I can see the mental clock in your room and on the screen of your uh, computer. They, they, they both say 501. Yes. But, but, but they're not on daylight savings time anymore. Daylight? On the last Sunday of October, in America, we set our clocks back an hour. And sunrise is an hour earlier. These clocks? Have all been reset, yes. The sun will be up in eight minutes. You tricked me. Tricked you? No, I... I okay, yes, I did. No, you are not uh, worthy to become my bride. Uh, Die, Mina, my by the hands of Count Dracula. <coughs> Die. Die. Oh, unconscious. Yes. Now I feast. Oh, don't kill her, Master. Renfield, what are you doing here? Well, she promised me a puppy, see, and, and she invited me to dinner. You may join me for dinner, but you have not been fully indoctrinated into the ways of the vampire, have you, Renfield? You can take care of that. A simple bite on the neck, and you will become a member of my family forever. Oh, I don't think I want that, Master. See, I've changed my mind about, you know, joining you. Do not fear me, Renfield. Oh, now, look, don't you come any closer, Master. I mean, I've got this bucket of water. <laughs> it's water from the pit out back. Now, look, you just stand where you are, not one step further. One bite, Renfield. Stand back, I'm serious. I mean, don't make me throw this. Back. I said back. Ah! Ah! It's water from the old baptismal pool, Master. It's holy water. Ren Renfield? Oh, Mina, hey. Yeah, I just killed Count Dracula for you. And uh, and look, I mean, the sun's coming up. Now, will you get me? Ren Renfield? Oh, he's getting away. As the injured vampire bat winged furiously toward the Carfax estate, Quincy and Jonathan were straining to pry the final hinge off the Confederate bank vault with a crowbar. Hurry, the sky is getting lighter. Oh. You've done it. Follow me inside. Yes. Jonathan, energized by what he'd just helped accomplish, staggered into the vault behind Van Helsing and threw himself over the seven-foot black box. Oh. 
He wedged his fingertips under the lid and, shifting his weight, flung the coffin open. Get out! He's right to steal! Push the box outside! The vampire, now in human form, gasped as he watched. <laughs> Helplessly, his beloved coffin tumbled out of its murky hiding place. End over end, it danced into the increasingly amber morning air. A pirouette and a straight-up salute to the eons of sleepless sleep. It had supplied the Prince of Darkness, and the box fell hard, splintering into a thousand brittle pieces across the courtyard floor. Count Dracula fell to his knees, scooped the brown Transylvanian dirt from amid the wooden slivers. Red eyes glaring with hate, Dracula suddenly pointed a tapered finger at Van Helsing and cried, I, Count Dracula, command you. At once, Van Helsing's mind blinked. His hands and upper torso grew numb. He tried to break his own fall against the courtyard doorway, but couldn't. Quincy also felt the power of the vampire's anger and fought to keep awake. He staggered back, arms flailing, until they found the canvas bag the doctor had assigned him to carry. Quincy's fingers grasped the handle of the tin lantern. With as much effort as was left within him, he yanked the lantern from the bag and, in the same motion, sent it sailing through the air. The top came off in mid-air, and oil splashed Dracula about the face and shoulders. Momentarily blinded, the vampire turned away from his hunters. Quincy fell beside Van Helsing. Jonathan snapped the metal crucifix from its chain inside his shirt and held it high, reflecting the first ray of sunlight as it darted through the oaks, reflecting a ray of hope off the symbol of Christ's death and straight toward the symbol of the devil's life, Count Dracula. The beam of light acted as a torch. The vampire burst into flame, even as spears of sunlight pierced his brow, hands, feet, and sight. In the drawing of a breath, the vampire's body crumbled into dust and passed from sight. Later, Jonathan told me, I watched the creature die, and I swear, in those last final moments, as he dissolved from this earth, there was in his face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. Jonathan, um, hmm? what do you think of this as a closing? When Dracula died, new life began. Um, Renfield regained his sanity. Lucy Westernraw's body mysteriously disappeared, but that gave Quincy Morris new hope that his soulmate was still alive somewhere. Me, I'm returning to Atlanta. I've been promised a promotion at the Tribune. A book company has asked me to write about my experiences fighting vampires. And, best of all, you've become the working wife of a successful real estate agent. Mm. It's a new life for me, too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A wonderful life. Mm. So, so why don't I feel wonderful? I think you know why. Hand me the sky phone. Daddy? You've been listening to The Curse of Dracula, inspired by characters created by Bram Stoker, and starring Jennifer Crumbly Bonder as Mina Murray, Rick Wrights as Jonathan Harker, Scott Hilly as Van Helsing, Rebecca White as Lucy, Barry Mills as Quincy, and Jordan Williams as Count Dracula. Written and directed by Lee Davis. Produced by Lee Davis, Paul Hammock, and Paul Tate. Recording and post-production by Hammock Audio Services. Music by Philip Truitt. Marketing and media services by Stairwell Studios. Visit Sound Mind Theater online at www.soundmindtheater.com. Copyright 1998, Sound Mind Theater, all rights reserved. The Sonic Society will return in a moment with an interview with Sound Mind Theater's Lee Davis. 
I like my women like I like my robots. You probably load yourself up pretty fast, and that's like your last your last resort weapon. I still think that there's brains in this jar. No, I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen a UFO. If you believe, quote unquote. Because some of us fears that that's some of us it's food. I'm saying crossbow. My God, if anything, we go off subject every damn show. Yeah, ask the robot to see a monk. A monk. A monk or a monk? A monk. A monk? A monk? I work in retail, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like being a zombie. God hates monks. It's your government at work. The enraged water heater with claws. Sure, we all start killing each other for fuel. So. Start. Destructamundo. Bringing you the end of the world one podcast at a time. Visit us at www.destructamundo.com where you can listen to all our shows or subscribe to us through iTunes or your favorite podcast client. And we're back, and I'm Jack Ward, and we're speaking with Lee Davis from Sound Mind Theater. How are you today, Lee? Very good. How are you, Jack? Thank you. I'm, I'm doing very well. I want to say I'm really impressed with Curse of Dracula. Uh, thank you so much for sending it to us in the Sonic Society. Thank you. I'm looking forward to what Sonic Society is going to be up to in the next few months. Look, it's really exciting. Yeah, we're, we're really excited, too. Now, my question is, why radio drama? Um, what do you find so appealing about radio drama that you wanted to take like a classic like Bram Stoker's Dracula and make it into a radio play? Yeah, you know... Uh, I remember back in, in college, or even maybe before, before college, I don't know exactly when, but uh, Stan Freeberg used to, do those, used to do those great radio ads for radio. I uh, probably remember the one where he described uh, a helicopter picking up a giant maraschino cherry and dropping it into, I guess, Lake Michigan that had been drained and filled with chocolate. And uh, he, he, was, he was making the point in those ads that uh, you could do things on radio or with sound, basically that you could never do on television. And so I remember that just capturing my 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 imagination, and that started me with uh, everything that's happened so far with Sound Mind Theater and with the other thing. Uh, theater of the mind, it's really just another use of the imagination. And for me, what's so appealing about it is that, um, well, I should mention that uh, my my day job, my, com- my company produces commercial films and uh, some feature films and TV shows and that sort of thing. So I'm always looking with one eye on the budget. So when you're into radio production, when you're into audio theater or uh, audio cinema, you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about the budget. For me, that's the magic thing. You can go anywhere. You don't have a lot of boundaries on the size of the cast or the uh, cost of props or anything like that. It just seems like a big uh, blank canvas that uses the, the human mind to to make things happen. That's what's so fascinating about it for me. So, h- how long have you been making audio drama? Well, I started in college, which was back, back before the before the Civil War. When I was in college, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine and I used to earn money at at, at uh, dinners by doing uh, comedy routines, and we liberally stole from Evan and Costello and everybody else. And As we all one do. one night, in search of something a little more specific to us, we came up with a character called Captain Crouton, Space Marshal of the Universe, <laughs> and we did, we did a series of eight-minute audio dramas live for whoever would, actually for whoever, whoever would listen. Uh, we did all the music and all the sound effects and all the voices ourselves, two people there standing in front of you uh, while you listened. And we did them impromptu at first and made up things as we went along, and then we scripted them and then took them around to, uh, uh, like I said, dinners and occasions, talent shows, literally wherever you could because it was, it was so much fun to do sound effects and do music and everything ourselves. So... Captain Crouton grew into a series of comedy uh, bits that we did on uh, radio. I went to the University of Georgia. There was a program called Palladium, which I was one of the writers on. And Captain Crouton made an appearance there, and uh, it kind of took off for us. And Steve Coward, who was my partner at the time, we we did this Captain Crouton stuff, these small these uh, small radio shows ourselves two-man radio shows for several years after that, even after we got out of college. And um, that blossomed into Sound Mind Theater. So I actually, I've been working with 
audio drama and uh, this whole thing for about about 20 years now. So what have you learned from your process uh, in, in these 20 years? What would you say if you could give us some pearls of wisdom? Well, I don't have a lot of wisdom on, for, about anything, but uh, <laughs> I really have I've learned that it's all in the prep, it's all in the writing, it's all in doing everything you need to do in order to create the show before you actually record it. Um, we spend so much time, some of my theaters spend so much time on script development that <clears throat> at first we were going to do a show a month and build a catalog of one-hour shows that we would syndicate to radio stations and sell on uh, uh, CD. But we realized that as we started developing the shows that we were spend, that we needed more and more time to actually test out everything. Uh, any producer will tell you that it ain't, nothing's free, and although we've had some marvelous uh, actors work in our shows, we pay everybody. We pay everybody. It's a below-scale rate, but we pay everybody who's involved. So uh, that, going that route, you don't have a lot of money to experiment. So all of our shows have been uh, well planned out and well prepared, and uh, one of my other prop, uh, partners runs an audio studio, he uses Pro Tools as, uh, to do his recording and everything. And we do all the uh, sound effects ourselves. We record as much as we can ourselves uh, instead of going to records or anything like that. But you can imagine there's a long process of actually putting it all together. We have a um, – I'm, I'm jumping the gun on your questions, but it kind of <laughs> leads me into thinking about how we do put one of our shows together, which is basically script development. Then we uh, cast it. And Atlanta, we're near Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Uh, Atlanta has a, a pretty big pool of actors right now uh, that really jump at the chance. Every time we call one of them, they jump at the chance to do audio theater because they're so intrigued by it themselves. Oh, that's wonderful. So, yeah, we, we, we have not had anybody turn us down who we've approached. And um, so what it amounts to is when we get the script done, we'll email the script to the actor and ask them if they have points on how to tweak their parts so it matches them better. If there's phraseology that they're more familiar with or more comfortable with, we'll actually mold the, the, uh, mold the character around the actor after a point so that when they walk into the, to the uh, studio to record for us, they really feel comfortable with what they're going to be doing. It's interesting because you're talking about some of the editing process, and that's some of the stuff that Andrew and I have found, that the actors will take it you know, beyond what you've done and want to tweak it and make it more realistic sounding. What's the writing process like for you before that? Like, Where do you get your ideas, and do you have like editing before you even get it out the door to the actors? Uh, some of theater, because we do uh, produce with our own money, we decided early on that we would try to come up with uh, broad-based general ideas that were, uh, the term pre-sold is probably too callous, but we do try to look for properties and look for uh, uh, stories that have already proven themselves somehow as being familiar to the public and that there's not a lot of reach to, um, to grasp exactly what we're up to. That's why we went with Dracula on this, this uh, Curse of Dracula show. Uh, Everybody, my other two partners have been intrigued, as have I, you know, forever, with the uh, Ron Stoker novel and the fact that it was, you know, it's written in an epistle form. It's a series of letters. So everybody who's ever interpreted, every, everybody who's ever tried to interpret the Dracula story had to go back to those letters and then make up their story, you know, as a drama. And we liked that challenge. So uh, we were looking for a character everybody knew about. As we... Um, as we get more familiar with what we're doing, and as we've um, uh, gotten a little more confident, I guess is the right word, we've actually come up with characters of our own, which are, we're in development right now. One of them is a female superhero along the lines of Wonder Woman named Amazonia. And uh-huh. uh, her adventures, uh, we should be uh, through the development stage in that pretty soon. We've done four full drafts of what we're going to be up to, what we're going to produce. And so, um, and it's taken. You know, it's taken a long time. It's taken six months to get the, wow. the script together. I want to I want to ask you more about some of the other stuff that you guys are doing at, at Sound Mind. But I want to ask first and foremost, what is the most challenging about producing 
you know, The Curse of Dracula. What was the most difficult and what was the most rewarding of getting that particular production done? Well, um, I'm assuming that uh, your your audience might hear it or uh, be intrigued enough to listen to it or whatever. When they do hear the story, they'll understand that we took a, an interesting tilt on it, uh, and I think that's probably the most uh, interesting and exciting part, what we did. We actually took the Dracula legend and presented it intact and then uh, introduced a couple of characters that were comic characters, and at the end, it turns out, I mean, I'm not giving away anything, but simply saying that the, the female character, Mina, is actually uh, solving problems of her own. She comes into the story with baggage, uh, separation from her parents and from her father in particular, and the story, uh, the Dracula story, becomes Mina's working through this problem so that at the end, she she feels like that she can actually return to the problems that she was trying to escape. And uh, it's like uh, facing up to what inner demons she had were, it, it was, uh, Dracula was part of that. She gained, she gained uh, encouragement and she gained uh, uh, courage through this adventure that she and her, her fiancé have facing off with Dracula. So taking the legend spinning it in a totally different situation so that everybody thinks they know what's going to happen as they start, and then it turns into a little bit of a different story, but not any less satisfying of a story. That, in terms of storytelling, was the most exciting thing we did. Uh, as we were piecing it together, and as we knew we had a very strong actress playing Mina, one of my partners said, you know, this really sounds a lot like her story. And then the other one said something to the effect of, yeah, but it, we can't make it her story. So we were walking this fine little line of whose story we were actually telling, and um, we felt like we made it happen. We felt like that the audience would come out at the end both having the thrills of a, a horror movie story, but also uh, the sentimental edge of a, a coming-of-age type feel to it. I agree. I'll I Sorry, think you did a really good job of being able to bring that out in Mina, and I, certainly there was a, a super connection for me uh, listening to it that Mina uh, really comes out. It, it, Like you said, it draws in the audience of having sort of a coming-of-age story and still having that horror, and that's what you want. You want them to connect with Mina in such a way that, you know, when, when the time comes and she's seduced from Dracula, you know, you're rooting for her to escape. The Sonic Society will return after this brief station break. This is Jack Ward, host of The Sonic Society. Each week we bring the very best of audio cinema from around the world to our members, and up until recently, we could only accept fully completed projects. Now it's your chance. You don't need a sound studio or a mic to contribute. Go to www.sonicsociety.org and find the Consortium Comics link. Consortium Comics is an audio comic book project where you get to give us your original superhero stories. Our talented Shadowlands Theater Troupe will take your scripts, record them with music and sound effects, and put them on the air. Listen to the Sonic Society each week and now become a contributing member of Consortium Comics. Because audio cinema is not just something you listen to. It's movies in your head. Coming up from Dream Realm Enterprises, Episode 6 of Robots of the Company. Dream Realm Enterprises presents... Welcome to the Dr. Phil Botmix Brocket Show. Today's time. It's a common problem these days aboard company ships. Robotic anger and how to treat it. Our guest today is a member of the deep space cargo ship, the Titan One. Hello, Miss Shinwat. Welcome to the show. Get off my case. Oh. Whoa! That's some pretty potent anger you got there, little missy. What's it to you, Buster? Let me assure you, I'm only here to help you resolve these issues you have with your crewmates. Can you tell me 
when all this started? Yeah, shortly after the cliffhanger was resolved. Cliffhanger? Can you explain for my studio audience? Studio audience? There ain't nobody here but us and Kimbodicus. And don't forget about me! Already have. <laughs> oh, shut up. And now, Miss Wap, that is no way to behave. You must recognize that your hostilities may be directed at the people around you. But in truth, they spring from a self-loathing that probably goes back to your childhood. Maybe even as far back as your bot toddler days. And now, Miss Wap. Stop calling me that before I belt you. It's either Shinwipe or Commander. Got it? Ah, uh, I see. Now, don't you see that what you're really doing is projecting a deep-rooted superiority complex? Now, honestly, what are you thinking? It seems to me that we're getting to the heart of the problem. This clearly is anger that is actually coming from deep within your subconscious positronic network. That is actually directed towards your parents. Now, wouldn't you say that's true? Parents? I don't have parents. I'm a bot. I was put together on the assembly line at Robotex Inc. What are you, an idiot? Oh. Now, Miss White. Was someone who was a star of his own galactically syndicated show who makes a cool mill a week really be considered an agent? I mean, look at me. I'm too tall, I'm too thick, and my head cover is thinning. But I'm no dummy. I'm freaking famous. Thanks to my friend Oakbot. Get real. <laughs> No, you're really asking for it, bub. If you keep this up, I'll kick your f***ing metal all the way from Tarsus 3 to f***ing Nebulus 4. Uh, now, 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 Miss Wife, I, I, I didn't mean get real angry. Oh. Well, I... I can see it's time for rock and That's right, Dr. Philbot. We'll be right back after these brief but also important messages. In other words, our sponsors have paid big bucks to be heard, so now you're going to get the hard sell rammed right down your throat. So sit back and bow to the corporations of the galaxy, and be sure to stay tuned for the conclusion of today's show, or else. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday! Dingling Brothers presents the Meccano Carnival! Gasp at a toaster swallowing an entire butter knife! Witness a freakish refrigerator with two ice dispensers! See a microwave shot 50 feet in the air! Bust a gasket with the hilarious antics of the All Weed Whacker Band! Thrill to the horror of the television without cable! All appliances under 10 amps get in free! Plus free spark plugs and air filters for the young ones. The Dingling Brothers Meccano Carnival. Show up early, show up late, but just show up! From the producers who brought you Evil Yo-Yo and Evil Yo-Yo 2 The Return comes the tale of a demonic vending machine. Harsh Vendor. Hey, how can I eat this soup without utensils? The ability to dispense hot soup is insignificant next to the power of the spork. A story for all ages, raves the Punxsutawney Post-Dispatch. The circle is now complete. When you left, I was immobile. Now, I have the casters. Only the casters of Cheetos, Harsh. You must be kidding, my master. Ripped from the headlines. You stupid machine, I gave you two bucks. Now give me my corn nuts. Cook, I need a fiver. No, this can't be happening. Search your wallet. You know it to be true. Tender mercy, this film's good, hollers the Holland Tulip Times. These chips are stale. <coughs> I find your lack of taste disturbing. The best evil robotic vending machine movie this year claims the Schenectady Tattler.
if you only knew the power of the clock bar. Harsh Bender, now playing at the Trelgor 4 Mega Monsterplex. Hey there, my name's Guido. Do you have a problem with body odor? No, not your own. I mean those ones stacked up in the cellar like cordwood. Well, that's why I'm here. I run Jiffy Stiff, the ten-minute embalming service. If your loved one's not in and out in ten minutes or less, the next one's free. Be sure to try our drive through window and after-hours drop-off box. Remember our name, Jiffy Stiff. Look for us under the big neon casket. Robot News with your robotic news anchor, Fizz Gizzit. Hello, I'm Fizz Gizzit. Today in Robot News, we interrupt your regularly scheduled program for a very special announcement. Today, in a surprising move, a press release was um, released announcing that the character of Shin White will no longer be appearing in this program. Holy cow! When asked to comment on this amazing turn of events, the production staff of robots of the company were quoted as saying, the reasons for this are simply too complex to even begin to go into. Don't even ask. We won't tell. The spokesperson for DRE went on to say, We're sorry for the shocking way the script writer has opted to handle the situation. The simple truth is, he was just too lazy to come up with a fresh new idea to write the character out. And so he has decided to simply cop out. It is my unfortunate job to tell you that you're completely out of luck if you had hoped to see this character get a proper send-off. Wow, who could believe it? We now go to our roving reporter, Frag Meltdown, for tonight's very special commentary. Take it away, Frag. Well, Fizz, it seems that tonight's episode is simply over. Yes, that's right, over. The big question that now remains on my mind is simply this. Why the hell are you people still listening? Don't you have anything better to do than sitting around your computers expecting a logical conclusion to anything on this show? which, I point out, wasn't even a show at all this week. It was just something they sort of threw together. Honestly, Frank, what are you talking about? Look, Buster, I don't have to answer to you. In fact, you are nothing but a big metal tin can with a mouth. And a big one at that. <laughs> so there. How utterly, incredibly informative as usual, Frag. Thank you for the amusement. This has been your robotic news anchor, Fizz Gizzit, with another robot news update. Robots of the Company, episode number 204, The Dr. Philbot Show. Written by Jonathan Patrick Russell, with additional material written by Joe Thomas. Starred in order of appearance, announcer bot, J. Thomas Jeans, Dr. Philbot McSprocket, Jeff Niles, Shinwipe, K. Wu, Fizz Gizzit, and Frag Meltdown, and the creditor, Jonathan Patrick Russell. The title theme was written and composed by Daryl Looney. The incidental music was provided by Daryl Looney with additional material by Firstcom. The associate producer was Kay Wu. The post-production editor, script editor, executive producer, and director was Jonathan Patrick Russell. The series, Robots of the Company, is copyright 2005, Dream Realm Enterprises, all rights reserved. Any rebroadcast or reproduction of this program without the express written permission of Dream Realm Enterprises is strictly prohibited. Thank you for listening. We invite you to visit us on the web at dregold.net. For more information, please email us at darkbuilding1 at yahoo.com. The comments and opinions expressed by Frag Meltdown were his comments and opinions and his alone. They do not reflect the opinions of the company. Praise the company. Thank you for your patronage. Be sure to join us here next time for a heartfelt episode entitled Company for the Robots. Copyright Dream Realm Enterprises 2005. And that's this week's show. Thanks so much for participating in the Sonic Society. Be here next week as we continue to scare and amuse you with the almost frightening, always entertaining works of schlock theater. Join us, won't you? The Sonic Society was produced and directed weekly by Andrew Dorfman and Jack Ward. Theme music by Sharon B. The Society originates from CKDU in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, which can be found on the web at www.ckdu.ca and is also rebroadcast through affiliated stations around Canada and the United States of America. 
Look for upcoming episodes and schedules for the Sonic Society through our website at www.sonicsociety.org. See you next week at this same time in the Society. Until then, I'm Jack Ward. Sometime now, those voices have been warning that he was coming. He? Count Dracula. But, but why is he coming? Why is he here? I do not know. But I believe he is responsible for Miss Westerner's state of mind. You're saying Lucy's been turned into a vampire? Th that's ridiculous! Okay, she may sound weird, but she's up and walking. She's in the daylight, even. It takes more than one encounter for someone to fall full victim to the curse of Dracula. He will undoubtedly approach her again tonight. That is why the timing of our plan must be perfect. Uh, our plan? I assume you wish to protect your friend from harm. After nightfall, once Dracula has risen from his coffin, I shall steal it away and destroy it. Come sunrise, he will have no shelter from the sun. Wait, sunlight is supposed to turn a vampire into dust, right? That is correct. You're going to steal the coffin, but you just said it was too heavy. For me, but not for Eric and Carl. Eric and... Oh, okay, your men in white. <laughs> yeah, they look strong enough to move the world. Okay, when do we leave? It's best you stay here. No, I'm going. Someone must protect this house. What with your fiancé being incapacitated, Miss Westenra being under a spell, and Quincy being... Well, Quincy. Are you a religious woman, Miss Murray? Uh, I used to be. Hmm, pity. You must double your protection, then. After I am gone, close and lock all the windows and doors. There is a spice rack in the pantry. Grind and sprinkle the more pungent spices, especially the garlic, on the floor around each bed. Search the house for crucifixes, Bibles, and the like, and display them prominently. I wasn't sure I bought this whole Dracula thing. But to play it safe, I decided to follow Dr. Van Helsing's directions to the letter, beginning in Lucy's bedroom. I prefer the French door stay open. I... Um, the weatherman says it's supposed to rain. I'd hate for moisture to ruin all those beautiful antiques, especially that old stand-up Victrola. Where did you get that? What did you say? Where did you get that old, um, um, yes, record Yes, I player? do. You know I do. Lucy? But why her? Won't I do? You know I would make a good wife. Yes. I will. All right, master. Mina? Huh? He wants to speak with you. Who does? He will meet you outside in front of the house. What's you want to speak to me about? Go to him now. You have been chosen to become his bride. Through the front window, I could make him out. A tall, motionless figure standing in the shadows of the lawn. Pale, white face. Eyes and teeth gleaming. His shiny, knee-length cape wrapped tightly around him like some evil cocoon. He wants to talk to me about unholy matrimony, eh? I said to myself. Fine. We'll talk. And the longer we talk, the more time it will give Van Helsing and his muscle men. Quincy! You know, I was thinking, there's a pit out back where they used to hold baptisms. Jonathan's got some bad bruises on his rear and legs. We might be able to use that cement pond for muscle therapy, like they do at some hospitals. Oh, we'll talk about that later. Um, Right now, uh, one of Dr. Van Helsing's patients has escaped, and he's out in the front yard. Want me to shoo him away? From what the doc says, they're pretty harmless. No, I'll shoo him away. You just get a baseball bat or a polo mallet or a snow shovel, whatever you can find, and, and be my bodyguard. Well, okay. Is it Renfield? I don't know.
It's probably Renfield. According to the doc, he's always trying to escape, and he's afraid of water. I'll get a bucket. No, get a weapon, and and meet me on the porch in five minutes. Hello. Good evening. Can't you step into the light? I I can't see you. Better yet,、uh, come inside. No, I dare not enter this house. Allow me to formally introduce myself. I am Count Dracula. I am Mina Murray. And I am Quincy P. Morris. Okay, Renfield, I know it's you. You're trying to scare us dressed as Batman. Well, it won't work. So why don't you just skedaddle back up to the nut house? Go on. Quincy. I got a bucket of water here, and I'm gonna throw、no. it on you if you're not gone by the time I count to three. Quincy, this is Dracula. Whatever. One. The real Dracula. Right. And I'm Dorothy, and I'm gonna drench the wicked witch of the west if she don't fly away. You、Two. should listen to your beautiful friend, Mr. Morris. I am Count Dracula. Yeah. Then turn into a vampire bat. Quincy. Go ahead, Lugosi. Change into a bat and bite me. Watch out! Hey! I want to know something. If you're through, yes. Why Jonathan? Why Lucy? And why me? My plan was to purchase the Carfax estate and draw your Mr. Harker to Transylvania in hopes that you would accompany him. And when that did not work. I had no alternative but to journey here and claim you. Claim me. You, Mina Murray, are the mirror image of Helena Kraus. Who's Helena Kraus? The only true talent to ever grace the European stage, a goddess. Her- the Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn dot com. That's L I B. Syn. dot com. The Radio Memories Network welcomes you to the world of modern radio theater, an old medium revived for a new era through the Radio Memories Network. From the four corners of this world, there are more than 341 million people who speak English. This is the society of the ear, the society of the mind. Our voices are legion. Here we have the opportunity to spread stories through the theater of the mind, all across the cyber byways and radial beacons. We are inclusive. We are eclectic. We are collective. We are the Sonic Society. Welcome to another meeting of the Sonic Society. I'm your host, Jack Ward. Each week we delve into the suspenseful and the sublime, the action-packed and the erudite. We look into masterpieces of audio cinema and some of the mayhem behind the sonic scenery. Membership is inclusive. You already have the best seat in the house. Orson Welles knew how to draw a crowd. Whether it was from his groundbreaking Macbeth with all black cast, or frightening Middle America with the invasion of Martians in his recreation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Orson understood that radio drama, that audio cinema, required one fundamental rule: make use of excellent material. This lesson wasn't lost in Sound Mind Theater's production of *The Curse of Dracula*. Drawing upon the classic Bram Stoker tale, Lee Davis produces a modern audio horror sure to raise shivers. Later, we'll have a conversation with Mr. Davis from Sound Mind Theater, and continue our weekly serial from Dream Realm Enterprises with Robots of the Company, Episode Six. But without further ado, let us wing our way through suspense with the Curse of Dracula here on the Sonic Society. And now. 
Sound Mind Theater presents a new radio drama inspired by characters created by legendary author macabre Bram Stoker. Listen. Listen to our tale of mystery, danger, and the supernatural. Listen as the dungeon door opens on our story of... of Dracula. Dear Arthur, as you know, I haven't been in touch for about a week. I know, I know, you always told me that a good reporter keeps her editor informed, but you also told me never to submit anything unless it was the complete story. Well... These are the events that brought me to this moment in time, sitting here alone, typing on my laptop, waiting for Count Dracula. Okay, this story begins one week ago. You were in your office at the paper in Atlanta, and I was 20,000 feet straight above you. You're calling from where? A jet. We just took off from Hartsfield. Hartsfield? As in Hartsfield International Airport? Yes, I'm on a sky phone. I, look, I called to tell you're you... You're supposed to be in Savannah, Mina, covering the flower show, like I told you. I've got something better for you, Arthur. I don't want something better. You're a newspaper reporter. I'm a newspaper editor. I assign you to cover things, you cover them. That's how this little game works. This is the very reason I sent you to work out of Savannah for a while. Remember, Mina? You're a good reporter, Mina Murray. I've never seen a greedy with so much natural talent. But you're so full of yourself and, and you're stubborn as a mule. You need to be taken down a notch or two. I love you like an uncle. Now, you know that. And when you love somebody, sometimes you... Well, you have to... You have to banish them. Savannah's a good news town. Besides, your boyfriend Jonathan, Mr. Real Estate, lives down there. And your friend Lucy is letting you stay at her little motel for free. Never mind, never mind. Look, I called to tell you my Stoker interview should be ready for next week's living section. Stoker interview? Jonathan's real estate firm assigned him to go to Transylvania and get Brom Stoker's signature on a contract. So I'm going along to interview Stoker one-on-one -on -one right after the wedding. Oh, 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 hold the phone. Start back at the beginning. Uh, okay. Remember on the phone the other day, I said that I saw in Entertainment Monthly how one of the Hollywood studios paid $5 million for the movie rights to a new book by Bram Stoker, the great-great-great-grandson of the guy who wrote Dracula. And you said Stoker's new novel, The Curse of Dracula, was sure to be next summer's big movie blockbuster and that you'd give anything to give an exclusive interview with a guy. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well... Jonathan's going to Transylvania to give Bram Stoker's signature on a contract, so I'm going along. I'll email the interview back to you, okay? So have a great week. Oh, yeah, I knew you'd be as excited as I am about the Stoker interview, so uh, I, I forged your name on an expense account voucher. Listen to me and listen good. I want you to turn around. The plane, I want you to turn it around. Now you go up to the cockpit and you tell the pilot to turn back to a series of pictures. First, that thing over there. Then... The return of that thing over there. And then, that thing still over there. Then, I need a flashlight or I might get eaten by that thing over there. And finally, hey you kids, get away from that thing over there. What do you think? Mina, make him stop. Uh, tell you what, uh, Quincy, Jonathan's supposed to conserve his strength, so mm. why don't we hold down the talking right. and just let him take a nap? Good. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, a good title makes a horror movie. Oh. Don't you think? Like, for instance, Attack of the Beanbag Chairs. Good title, good movie. And the Crazy Maniac Guy series... Crazy maniac guy with an axe. Crazy maniac guy with a soldering iron. Crazy maniac guy with a hairdryer. Colon, never bathe again. Good titles, good movies. And the Quincy with his shaggy hair, goatee and earring, reminded me of the laid-back dreamers, the teen philosophers and the future felons Lucy used to date in high school. 
Why she refused to get close to this particular member of that species, I wasn't sure. Maybe Quincy was just trying too hard for his own good. Anyway, soon we arrived at Lucy's bed and breakfast, a one-story 19th century farmhouse surrounded by mossy oaks. But it turns back into an insurance salesman, so they shoot it again just to be sure. The end. Fade out, roll titles. Hey, we're here. Quincy, um, who's that older guy walking toward us and those two men dressed in white with Lucy? That's Dr. Van Helsing. He's the head man at the new insane asylum. Insane asylum? Down the road, yeah. Oh, and I almost forgot to tell you. Watch out for Lucy's weird mood. What kind of weird mood? She's been in it since late last night. Um, do me a favor, will you, Mina? What kind of favor? Put in a few good words for me with Lucy. You know when you can. I really care about her. A lot. Okay? Okay. Welcome home, Mina. Welcome home, Mina. What kind of greeting is that? Lucy, give us a hug. There's time enough for that later. You had a safe journey? Yeah, uh, we did. Uh, Jonathan's asleep. Dr. Van Helsing, this is Mina. Ah, Miss Westenra has told me a lot about you, Miss Murray. Charmed. Uh, hello. With a sharp wave of his hand, Dr. Van Helsing, a bald 60-ish man wearing thick, thick glasses and a gray business suit, signaled the two men in white. One of them opened Jonathan's car door. The other scooped him out and effortlessly carried him into the house. Half an hour later, with the sun a bright October orange on the horizon and Jonathan resting peacefully in his room, Lucy, Quincy, and I saw the doctor out. Will you and your assistants stay and dine with us, Dr. Van Helsing? Thank you for the kind offer, Miss Westerra. But I have already dismissed my men back to the hospital, and I thought I might drop in on the Macmillans in the next house down. Did Mrs. Macmillan have her baby yet? Mother and child are at home and resting well. At home and resting well. That would be a good movie title. Quincy said you work near here, Doctor? This past Wednesday, we occupied the building that formerly housed the Savannah Emergency Clinic. We? We're a mental health facility. I believe you know one of our patients, a Mr. Renfield. Renfield? He's spoken of you and your fiancé, and he claims to know our new neighbor at Carfax. New neighbor? You mean someone bought Carfax, the old Confederate building? This week, things have changed a lot. Good title. The week things changed a lot. I saw the movers at Carfax early yesterday morning and tried to call on Mr. Stoker. Stoker? Did you see Stoker? Meet, meet him? No, I, I only know the name because it was written on the mover's recorder. Uh, Mr. Bram Stoker. From? From Eastern Europe. New neighbors? Hey, this place could use some fresh blood. Fresh blood. Good title. That's the bell beside Jonathan's bed. I shall see to his needs. Help me open the window in his room, will you, Quincy? Let in some of this fresh night air. Listen. Wolves. That's not wolves. What's wrong with you, Lucy? That's that old hound dog at the Macmillan place, howling for a supper. Shut up, Blue! Still, listen to them. The children of the night. What music they make. Good evening, Doctor. Quincy? Coming. The children of the night. I like that. Have a pleasant evening. Miss Murray, forgive my seeming forward, but I am concerned about your friend. Well, if you don't mind my asking, exactly what kind of doctor are you? I am a psychiatric physician with a doctorate in hallucinatory medicine. I was educated in Berlin, but I was born in Transylvania. Transylvania? Yeah. There I learned the truth. So, what is the truth, Dr. Van Helsing? The truth is that the Bram Stoker novel was less fiction than autobiography. And the truth 
is that a large black box was delivered to the Carfax estate yesterday morning. A coffin. Lined, I suspect, with an inch-thick bed of Carpathian soil. I tried to force it open, but I hadn't the strength. I work with lunatics, Miss Mary. Men and women who seem attuned to voices beyond the realm of the natural. Like... Renfield? Yeah, and Vanna. And tell him not to be surprised to see a fat, balding white guy running toward the plane like a bat out of Helena when it lands, because I'm... Phew, <sighs> I'd forgotten how cramped those airline toilets were. Everything all right, dear? Uh, yes. Who's on the phone? Arthur. Um, um, I'll give Jonathan your regards. Right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Is he excited about the trip? Uh, delirious. What about you? Uh, stomach still nervous? Yeah, I'm okay. I just can't help thinking about poor Renfield, that's all. He was salesman of the year last year, you know. And they send him to get this same contract signed in Transylvania, and when he gets back... He was a walking time bomb, Jonathan. Everybody said so. Yeah, but now he sits alone all day in that psych ward, counting his buttons and eating flies. Hey, look, the difference between you and Renfield is that he didn't go crazy until after he got to Transylvania. <laughs> you lost it weeks ago, and you proposed to me... <laughs> Mm. Wait until we've been married a few years. You'll know what crazy is. I was friends with the guy, that's all. <laughs> I know, I know. With some rest, he'll be fine. You called your editor. Why don't you just take a moment and phone your dad? Phone my dad? For what? To let him know his only daughter's going to be married in romantic old Vienna. You should phone him, Mina. You know I don't want anything else to do with my dad in his pious little world. Mina, it's silly to blame your dad and his faith for your mother's death. Drop it, Jonathan. It's been six months. I said drop it. I just think he'd like to hear from you, that's all. I got a couple of faxes this morning. One from the Hotel Vienna. We got the bridal suite. Wonderful! <laughs> and Bram Stoker's book publisher says they're not allowing any official interviews. No interviews? No Official interviews. But they said I could ask for an unofficial interview. Oh, Jonathan, I love you. <laughs> so, 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 so you'll meet with him the first, okay? And then talk him into seeing me? Yes, I will. Ah! Promise? Cross my heart, hope to die. Neither Jonathan nor I were what you'd call frequent international flyers, so it came as quite a shock to learn as we stepped off the jet, expecting to get married at the Hotel Vienna, that Austrian time was about seven hours ahead of Eastern Daylight Time. And that meant Jonathan had only three hours to get to Bram Stoker's great-great-great-grandson's house, which was three hours away by train. We had to go straight to the station. I kissed Jonathan goodbye. And as I did, I got an eerie sensation that I would never see him again. When I checked into the Hotel Vienna bridal suite, alone, the innkeeper's wife was sympathetic. Oh, one person spending the night alone by herself, with her young hair not alone with her? This is not a pretty picnic. <laughs> no, Miss Hamill, it, it's not a pretty picnic. Uh, you, you will join him later? Yes, uh, tomorrow, hopefully. If he can get permission for me to interview Bram Stoker. Stoker? You've heard of him, I'm sure. Descendant of the man who wrote... Oh, please, Dra please, please, please. Do not speak with your mouth that name. You mean Dra... Please! You will cross my inn and all that abide here. You will wait here. Uh, you will wait here. Uh, you, will, you will take this with you. For to keep on your purse. A rosary? I'm not Catholic. Neither is he. Where under your clothes? And, and this, where outside your clothes? A necklace? A crucifix. Wear it. And here is some garlic. Put cloves of garlic under your pillow when you are sleeping in the bed at night. But Mrs. Hamill, I... I <coughs> Mrs. Hamill, I don't... Take them. For your mother's sake. Three hours to Transylvania, 30 minutes to get to the castle, then maybe two hours worth of real estate chit-chat with the devil over dinner. I expected Jonathan back in Vienna on the late train. I waited at the station until 3 a.m. The coach, when it did finally arrive, 
was empty. Had I known what my dear, sweet Jonathan was going through, I... Only much later did I learn the details through the memos he recorded on his pocket tape recorder. Memo to Bonnie at the travel agency. Dear Bonnie, obviously Mr. Stoker is trying to show me some local color with this horse-drawn mix master. But the antique delight of it all wore off the tenth time I had hit the... Ow, roof. I feel like I'm trapped in a paint shaker. <sighs> if we can just get the door open. That was quite a ride. You wish me to stay until your business is concluded? Yes, I do. I did not think so. Memo to self. Pack a flashlight. You know, you know I, th- I think I'm here on the wrong night. <clears throat> Memo to Bonnie at the travel agency. I'm going to get you for this. Mr. Harker. Yes, I'm Jonathan Harker. So nice to finally meet you, sir. You are alone. Alone. Yeah. I was afraid I had the wrong night, or the wrong hour. You know, daylight savings time kicks in about this time of year back home, and, um... Listen to them. The children of the night. What music they make. Please, come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I bid you welcome. I am Dracula. (laughs) Say, that's... No, that's pretty good. I guess your visitors expect to hear you say that, right? I mean, so so I disappoint them. <laughs> you said I am Dracula. I mean, you're 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 trying to scare me, right? My servants are away tonight, sir. May I take your coat? No, no, thanks. All I have is this jacket, and I have to admit, I was ill prepared for the change in the temperature. You have traveled a great distance. Oh. Well, it's no problem. Um, Lots of my clients like to conduct business in person, you know, and instead of through the mail or by fax. Well, plus Carfax, the estate you're buying, it's not exactly a shack in the woods. So I'm sure you know that it was the Confederate equivalent of Fort Knox during the Civil War, a gold repository. In, In fact, in the same neighborhood, there's another historic structure that I'm really familiar with. It's a it's a bed and breakfast. Follow me. Fist owned by. Of course. <sighs> this is more like it. It's a light and cheery in here. And, and the table's set for dinner and... Oh, fire. Now that's a welcome sight. Oh, please, warm yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh boy, this, this is great. I assume the uh, contracts are in your briefcase. Yes, yes they are. Um... Would you like to just go ahead and and sign them now? Enter. Ah, good evening, my lovelies. (laughs) Gretchen, Olivia, Anna, meet Mr. Harker. Welcome, Mr. Harker. Yes, welcome. We hope we have prepared your quarters to your liking. Thank you, ladies. But I can't stay. We can't close on the house until I get this contract back to Savannah. (laughs) Are you three in some sort of singing group? (laughs) Singing group? The long white gowns, the heavy pale makeup. Um... (laughs) Yes, like I said, uh, I'd like to stay, but... Now, if you'd be so kind as to escort me to the door. Now, husband. Now. He is with you. Uh, Good night, Mr. Harker. Uh, Uh, Sweet dreams. (laughs) No. Uh, Wait. 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 Mr. Stoker! Mr. Stoker! Come back! Ladies, I I, I told you I I can't stay. Excuse me, ladies. Let me by, please. What are you doing? No! No! Get away! 
For 48 hours, I practically slept at the Vienna train depot. Mr. and Mrs. Himmel tried to comfort me with tales of how poor communications were in this region of Europe, but it was obvious they held little hope for Jonathan's safe return. Noon of the third day, I received a telegram from the Holy Cross leper colony in the small town of Bistriz, nearly five miles from Castle Dracula. Jonathan was alive! He had had a mild concussion, a fractured rib, and some of the worst bruises the doctors had ever seen down his back and across his midsection. But he was alive, and he would recover with proper rest and a nurse's care. Sure, why not? This is the slow season, and somebody may as well take advantage of the nursing degree my daddy paid for. Jonathan did not hold much affection for my friend, Lucy Westenra. Dingy, he called her, since the day that she graduated from nursing school and announced that she was moving to Savannah, Georgia, to run a tiny motel she'd bought out of an ad in the back of the Southern Living magazine. Growing up with Lucy was fun. She was sweet, mischievous, totally unpredictable. And yes, dingy, which in Jonathan's eyes meant irresponsible. But when I phoned her, and with no hint from me, she volunteered to shut down the bed and breakfast for a month and allow Jonathan to recuperate in Savannah. I knew this was an opportunity to get my fiancé back up on his feet and show him what a loving, wonderful friend-in-law he was getting. By the way, what does your daddy say about all this Dracula stuff? He, uh, he, he doesn't have an opinion. Because you haven't told him, have you? My stars, man, he's your daddy! I'll call him and tell him Jonathan and you are coming here and that you're okay. Whatever. I think, I think I've got all the details. Day after tomorrow, you'll fly into Atlanta, then catch a commuter plane to Savannah. I'll send Quincy to pick you up at 5 o'clock. Quincy? Oh, I forgot to tell you. A guy I went to nursing school with showed up here right after you left. Quincy Morris. Do you remember him? Well, vaguely, Quincy Morris... Uh... Beatnik type, right? What, uh, uh, he, was, he was a movie nut. Still is. He says he's been looking all over the southeast for me for months. He says he's ready to settle down, and I'm the one he wants to settle down with. What? Yeah, he says I'm his soulmate. But you're not interested in him? No. Tell him to take a hike. I would, but I need the septic tank pumped out. I'm going to let him stay in the guest quarters out back until he realizes I'm not his soulmate or until my fall repair jobs are all done, whichever comes first. Oh, did I tell you I'm thinking about joining the Peace Corps? Do they still have the Peace Corps? Gee, I don't know. <laughs> they still have monks, don't they? Well, I'm thinking about becoming a monk, too. Lucy, monks are guys. I must be playing their records at the wrong speed. Quincy picked us up at the Savannah Airport. You too comfortable back there? Hey, if you're in the newspaper business, you must know some people in the other media, right? Like movie producers? Know any movie producers? Um, none to speak of. Well, I got my degree in biomedical engineering, but I'm really a screenwriter, you know? Right now I'm working on a horror movie. It's called That Thing Over There. It's going to be a whole series.